You know, most of us want to be good value investors, so we study good value investors like Warren Buffett. With Warren Buffett, he's probably the best to ever live. There's endless videos and content and analysis made after Warren Buffett. And likewise with investors like Charlie Munger, Peter Lynch, Bill Ackman, very popular investors that you've probably heard about. But on today's video, I want to highlight a different investor that's also a value investor, in my opinion, a very good one. But there's far less written about him. There's far less said about him. There's not many videos on YouTube about him. In fact, he hasn't done really that many big interviews or anything like that. His results, though, are remarkable. His name is Josh Tarasoff, and like you can see, he's a bit younger than Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. And again, there hasn't been any interviews I can find, any real media around him. But I have found a couple things of the past that have really impressed me with what he's been able to do. First of all, Josh works differently than most big time investors. It reminds me a lot of Warren Buffett. If you know about Warren Buffett, he doesn't have a team of analysts and researchers working for him. He simply doesn't operate that way. He does research on his own companies and his own little office, and then he makes big investment decisions off of that information that he gathers himself. He might bounce some ideas off of Charlie Munger, but really he makes his own investment decisions. That's how Berkshire has ran. Now, Josh runs very similarly. He started his fund back in 2006 with only $2.3 million. Sounds like a lot of money to you and me if you're managing your own money, but $2.3 million in the money management industry is essentially nothing. Like that's not even enough to cover the base expenses of an office or any type of staff. Luckily, he had no office and he had no staff. He had no employees, no office, and he still operates that way today, even in the present. This is something I find very unique about Josh. He does all the investing himself for his entire firm. No employees, no staff, and he doesn't even have an office. He's basically running the investment firm out of his bedroom, right? He just wakes up, has his computer, does his research, makes investments based off of that. And his performance has been pretty remarkable. From 2006, where he started with $2.3 million, now the fund manages $450 million. So it's grown substantially over this time period. And of course, some of this is attracting new investors because when you have good performance, it attracts new money. And Josh has had incredibly good performance, 17.3% annualized. If you're not familiar, that is very good. That is better than the QQQ during this time period. About 2% better, which is very good considering the QQQ has been considered very tough, if not impossible to beat over the past 10 years. Well, Josh beat the QQQ since 2006, since the inception of his fund. And it's even more impressive he's been able to beat the QQQ without any staff, office, or any resources other than his own mind. He's basically used himself and just his own research to outperform the most difficult index. And the way that he's been able to do that is by accurately predicting the future with a lot of his investments. He's remarkable at seeing the future with his companies. One example I would give is this one here. This is a research paper that he wrote, a thesis he wrote about Amazon. And he wrote this back in 2012. So everyone knows Amazon's a great company right now. Everyone knows that. Everybody knows it because the market is rating it at $1.5 trillion. That's what Amazon is worth. The cloud business is phenomenal. They're building out huge infrastructure. They have a huge runway. They're continuing to grow revenues and profitability. But let's go back to 2012. In 2012, this wasn't so obvious. Amazon was only trading at $218 a share. Now it's at 3,200. So it was trading at 200 bucks a share, a $100 billion market capitalization. Uh, we have much smaller companies now uh, that were trading up past this point of where Amazon was just back in 2012, only 10 years ago, which is pretty remarkable to see. But Josh saw through this. He saw the future of this company when a lot of investors were concerned about it. Uh, they had false theses on it. Josh was able to accurately predict the future with this company. Listen to just some of his thesis here, and it's very long, so I won't go through all of it, but he highlights his investment idea, which is Amazon, which became a big holding in his portfolio. He starts off with this big statement here. Amazon is the finest business of which I am aware, and I believe it is still very cheap. He says it's the finest business, which is his way of saying it's the best business that he knows of, the best business in the world, and he thinks it's selling for cheap, which... Obviously it was, it was at $100 billion. If we could go back in time, all of us would be putting our life savings in it at that price point. He goes through some of the key things here. Amazon is a mass merchant. Amazon offers 14 million SKUs. Uh, it has the breakdown of different 
segments that it operates in. Strategy for mass merchants is simple. So he does an overview of what Amazon's competing with. Mass merchants compete on price, selection, and convenience. Walmart is the dominant mass merchant and its formula for success is straightforward. Scale efficiencies permit low prices. So as Walmart grows in scale, they can lower their prices and become more price effective. Low prices attract more customers. More customers drive greater scale. Greater scale permits further price decreases. That's the nice flywheel that Walmart has. Amazon possesses decisive advantages over these physical retailers. Amazon is structurally advantaged with respect to key competitive factors in physical retailing, price selection and convenience. Moreover, Amazon's business model affords it advantages that are unavailable to physical retailers. Personalization, you have your amazon.com account, habit forming. Advantage number one, cost structure and pricing. Physical retailers' largest operating expense substituted with technology. Labor and real estate are substituted with technology. Um, they say that real estate's inflationary. Technology is deflationary. Inventory management is more efficient. Inventory need not be replicated over thousands of stores. So Walmart has to distribute all their inventory evenly across all their stores. Amazon doesn't have to do that because they sell it online. Pulled by demand rather than pushed by merchandising. Inventory turnover. Amazon has 12 times, Walmart 8 times, Target 6 times. It goes on outlining all the advantages of Amazon. And again, let me remind you, this is back in 2012. None of this was that clear. It's clear now because we're living 10 years later. But back in 2012, this is remarkable to be able to come out with this thesis. Advantage number two, no selection constraint. Because physical store size must be finite, selection must be finite. This creates a trade-off between the number of categories in which a physical retailer can participate and the depth, specialization in each category. No such trade-off exists online. So on Amazon, you can sell way more stuff than you can with Walmart. Way more selection of categories. You can sell basically everything in a Walmart plus a thousand other things, a million other things. The only thing I think Walmart sells that Amazon doesn't is something like guns, right? But outside of those type of categories, Amazon has a vastly wider, superior selection of goods in Walmart. Advantage number three, convenience. Online customers can shop anytime, anywhere. They need not travel to and from the store, search the aisles, wait and check out lines. Other advantages that I think these were more obvious, online shopping obviously had advantages over physical retail. Advantage number four, personalization. Physical retailers cannot offer personalized experiences because armies of customers must go to the same location and interact with the limited number of associates. Online, customer behavior is automatically captured and used for individualized merchandising. That's different than physical retail. When you go to Walmart, you're not going to have it introduce you and say, hey, here's all the stuff you're buying last time. We've gathered together a new shelf with all the stuff that you're likely to buy this time. Amazon does that every time you visit their website. Every customer's Amazon.com page is not the same. Mine will look different than yours. Mine will have my most recent searches, just like our YouTube homepage won't look the same. Advantage five, habit forming. People form habits through repetition. And these habits are highly influential in shopping behavior. Unlike physical stores, people can shop Amazon every day, multiple times per day, when they need and desire for a product arises. It can be purchased on Amazon immediately. Amazon's availability is analogous to Coca-Cola's ubiquity. Now, this is already a pretty compelling bull case for Amazon. And I think this applies to a lot of other online retailers. But he continues on with this. Advantages widen every single day. The cost structure and pricing, selection, convenience, personalization, and habit forming. Focused on the long term. He shares some, uh, some things that are said in investor letters here of how Jeff Bezos is incredibly focused on long term of the company. He says that Amazon dominates online retailing. So even back in 2011, Amazon was the biggest online retailer ahead of Staples and Apple, uh, Walmart.com. Then we look at it and Amazon also dominates web only merchants. So Amazon has the most volume of payment going through them. You have Netflix underneath with, it's not even close, 3.2 billion versus Amazon's 48 billion. So Amazon already had first movers advantage. Historical growth. Look at the growth of this company. You have growth rates of 26% in 2002, and then in 2011, 40%. So the growth with Amazon is one of these Modi companies 
the companies that have big moats, and you can tell because the growth doesn't decelerate. Normal discounted cash flow analysis would show that a company should decelerate its growth over time, but Amazon was actually accelerating in growth because of AWS and the rapid expansion of their online marketplace. Growth is accelerating. Amazon has a large third-party marketplace business in which it sells products on behalf of third-party merchants. It earns a fee as a percentage of the sale value, estimated in the low double digits. These fees, as opposed to gross sales value, are booked as revenue. So when Amazon sells something from a third-party merchant, the entire item that it sells, the entire order, is not booked as revenue only the fees, which doesn't really give a full illustration of how much product Amazon is moving. So they're selling a ton of stuff, but because they're not booking all of that as revenue, only the fees, their revenue actually underestimates how much product they're selling. So he says the operating profit dollars are similar regardless of whether Amazon sells a product of itself and its third-party business. So either way, they make the same amount of operating profit even though the third-party sellers don't represent the same amount of revenue. So this is a little bit tricky, but he realized this with Amazon because of his research. Therefore, Amazon's unit trends are a better indicator of earnings power than revenue trends. So the revenue trends of Amazon, as good as they were, were understating the ability for Amazon to earn money because they weren't booking the total sales of third-party items as revenue. Just the, just the fees. And that's a very interesting thing that he brings up. I didn't even think about that until reading this. Third party has been increasing in the mix because third party revenue per unit is a fraction of that in the retail business. This mix shift has depressed revenue growth relative to unit growth. This is exactly the point I was just making. So he sees that the unit growth is actually growing much faster than the revenue growth. Because again, when they sell something as a third party item, they don't recognize the entire sale as revenue, just the fees, but the unit growth was at 50%, 49% in 2011. And the market's looking at this as just a 40% revenue growth company. In reality, they're really growing their sales, if you really want to compare it to other retailers, by 49%. The next decade looks promising. Yes, Josh, the next decade will be promising. I'm from the future, from 2022, here to tell you that the next decade Amazon's gonna turn out to be a very good investment for you. Starting from today's 40 to 50% unit growth rate, which is just incredible, even a reversion to the mean would imply a high prospective 10 year compound annual growth rate. And he has this broken down that even if Amazon started to revert back to the mean, even in that bearish case, it would still be an attractive investment. So here he has a margin of safety saying that even if the business was decelerating and reverting back to the mean and competitors were eating away at it, it's still an attractive investment. That's a huge margin of safety. Now, having said that, a dramatic mean reversion seems unlikely. I estimated Amazon possesses only 1% share of the categories in which it competes. Growth is accelerating. Active user accounts are growing at 26%. Spend per active account is growing at 12%. Selection is wider than ever. Recent introduction of Amazon supply, push into apparel category. Customer service ratings are setting records. Amazon is one of the few companies that goes back and forth with Costco as having the best customer service. Advantages are wider than ever and widening. E-commerce is an enormous tailwind. Enabled by mobile devices, consumers are turning to the internet for their shopping needs. Merchants of every stripe are responding by investing in their online offerings better websites, mobile sites, apps, free shipping, and returns. This constitutes a virtuous cycle, whereby e-commerce adoption increases the incentives for future adoption. Adoption also creates social proof and changes in consumer habits. So he doesn't just look at the numbers of this and run discounted cash flow analysis. Otherwise, he would be taken entirely out of this investment. In a normal, traditional spreadsheet analysis of Amazon at this time, you would find that Amazon is going to have slowing revenue growth, which is the opposite. AWS has kept its revenue growth. The retail business had accelerating revenue growth. You wouldn't find the things like he did, where he finds out that unit growth, unit economics are more important than revenue growth. So that would throw you off as well. And you wouldn't be looking at things like the consumer habits and the psychology behind Amazon. You wouldn't have that type of qualitative stuff added in. So when you combine all of this stuff and really look at a company overall, it can lead to these type of outcomes where you find an Amazon trading at $200 a share. And Josh talks about this very thing, about how our intuitions can be misleading with companies like this and the potential of these companies 
is very often underestimated. In the case of Amazon, it was incredibly underestimated. He says, I believe intuitions about the penetration potential of e-commerce are often overly conservative. Intuitions and behaviors are influenced by habit. Habits die slowly, but ultimately people respond to incentives. E-commerce offers the incentives of better prices, wider selection, and superior convenience. Pretty basic investment thesis. He's finding a company that has massive incentives for users to adopt it, which is Amazon. Wider selection, superior prices, superior convenience, better company, better experience, better incentives. The facts are compelling. This is where he breaks down intuition from fact. Your intuition would be enjoyable shopping environments cannot be replicated by the internet. That was the thing people were saying. Fact, bookstores are often the quintessential experience-based retail destination and books were the first category to move online. Intuition, people need to try on clothing. Fact, apparel and accessories is the second largest e-commerce category with 12% penetration of retail. So even people's intuitions about clothing needing to be tried on before being worn, not accurate. It's not even accurate in the case of Costco. There's no try on rooms, but Costco sells a ton of apparel. Intuition, people need and like to buy their own groceries. Fact, Groceries are rapidly moving online. In the UK is where that's starting and now it's all over the US as well. The next decade looks promising. E-commerce growth is accelerating. Penetration currently at 5%, could reach 20% within the next decade. Assuming retail sales grow at three to 4%, if e-commerce reached 20%, penetration in 10 years, it would grow at the high teens compound annual growth rate. Amazon should significantly outperform e-commerce, currently growing at three times the industry. So he's making some, I think, pretty conservative estimates on overall the trends, how things are growing online, and how Amazon will be the huge winner of this online growth. Pretty basic investment thesis. Where is things moving and what companies are going to take advantage of this big shift? Amazon's profitability is misunderstood. This is something that still happens today. People look at tech companies that reinvest heavily and they believe that they're overvalued because the P.E. ratios are high the price to sales are high. What they don't realize is that a lot of these companies are in reinvestment mode. A lot of them have suppressed earnings today for reinvestments that will pay off big time in the future. Amazon was one of them. And the investors that were able to realize this artificially suppressed earnings potential took advantage of this. And they had outsized returns because of the market not seeing through this and thinking that Amazon was super expensive of a company when it was really dirt cheap. Gap operating margins are lower than those of physical mass merchants and have declined. So that's something that a lot of value investors today would just write off. They'd say the gap operating margins are low. That's not something I want. I want high margins, high margin company. Amazon has always been in hyper growth. Amazon has always been in hyper growth mode, aggressively investing in new categories, new geographies, new customer acquisition, price decreases, customer experience and improvements, Kindle, Amazon Web Services, their non-retail business, investing for growth depresses margins. So even though their margins are depressed, it's for a good reason. This statement is incredible. Again, this is back in 2012. Amazing he was able to see this future in Amazon. It would be illogical to believe that if run for current profitability, i.e. if they canceled all their new projects, they shut off their entire growth engine, Amazon's margins would not be significantly higher than they are reported under GAAP. So he's saying if they if they decided to not reinvest in growth so aggressively and not grow their business, their profit margins and their gap margins would be huge. They wouldn't be these suppressed low margins that investors are glancing over and saying that's not an attractive investment. They don't earn a lot of money. If they turned off their growth engine and they normalized their business, it'd be incredibly profitable. Investors anchor on gap. And again, I see a lot of investors doing this today. They just look at the current state of the business, not the future state of the business. Josh Tarasov is looking at the future state of the business. Now, he highlights this call, this question from this analyst to Jeff Bezos. And the analyst asks Jeff Bezos, if your company Amazon is so efficient and has such good cost structure, then why by the numbers does companies like Walmart run more efficiently and have higher margins than Amazon? And Jeff reiterates the same point that Josh is pointing out here. Jeff says that, hey, we're investing in a lot of initiatives like web services and infrastructure and things that are going to make our, our business grow bigger. We're not focused on a cost structure for maximum profit margin. 
And that's something that a lot of investors get fixated on, wanting all the margin up front for a business and not the future. What you should be focused on. He outlines here what would happen if Amazon suddenly quit its reinvestment mode. We can define normalized operating income as the pre-tax cash flow that would be available for distribution to shareholders were Amazon to abruptly cut off its upward revenue trajectory. So if they cut off their growth mode, said we're just in profit mode now, this is the amount of normalized operating income Amazon could generate. The economic reality is that Amazon is actually generating this operating income, but is aggressively reinvesting back into the business. This is the exact same thing Amazon does today. It generates a ton of operating income, but all that operating income is going back into the business. Investors look at that and they say, wow, they're losing all this money building out this infrastructure, hiring new employees, building out vans, buying airplanes. Uh, that's all stuff that's going to further the growth of the business. Amazon versus Walmart and Target. Amazon's normalized operating margins should be greater than Walmart's US and Target's operating margins, which are 7 and 8% respectively. Amazon has no stores and a fraction of the employees. Not anymore. Amazon has grown so big, they have more employees than I think even Walmart does. I think they might have the same, but I think Amazon may have actually surpassed Walmart. Amazon has far more efficient distribution systems and virtually no shrinkage. In retail, shrinkage defines different products that are either stolen by employees or customers, uh, they get lost, different inventory issues, they get sent to the wrong place. All that type of stuff is kind of put in a basket called shrinkage. And Amazon has almost none of that because they don't have the physical retail locations. So there's no employees really to steal anything. They have their warehouses, but they're all, you know, they're all being watched and everything. It's more of a contained environment. And their distribution systems are far more efficient. So this is what he noticed back in 2012, and I'm sure the same thing, I'm sure it's the same thing today. Then he goes on saying that the third party sales, which was 35%, I think that's grown even more, a bigger percentage, generates far higher margins than traditional retail businesses. So overall, he's making the case that if Amazon suddenly decided to be a, a value dividend paying cash distributing company that was just focused on keeping its business, maintaining it, and distributing as much money back to shareholders as possible, it'd be able to effectively deliver a lot more money because it has higher margins. The company's structured better. The reason that they're not doing that right now is because they're still growing faster. They still have a huge total addressable market to, to accomplish. And you've seen them do that over the past 10 years since when this was written. I think it's the same thing today. I think Amazon is in the same mindset today. So that's his bull thesis on Amazon. And uh, again, this was back in 2012, pretty remarkable. He says the perspective stock CAGR, the compound annual growth rate. So now he's doing analysis on the price for which, which are the expected future returns. He says Amazon's perspective stock CAGR is similar to the perspective revenue CAGR. So he thinks that the stock price will follow the revenue over these times because he says the EBIT margins is likely to expand from 7%. Amazon believes it can reach double digits. The price to free cash flow multiple may contract. These two factors should roughly cancel out. That's his whole thesis on the uh, the growth of the stock price. Those two things are going to cancel out, and then it's just going to be left to the revenue growth. Therefore, I believe Amazon stock could return around 30% over the next decade. Around 30% is his estimate for the future return of Amazon. Let's go ahead and just look at a quick back test here of Amazon. This is from 2012, when that thesis was written, to current day. It has compounded at a rate of 32.66%, right around his estimate of around 30% growth rate. He was off by 2%, uh, just a little bit low. It's 32% compound annual growth rate. Now, this overall is just remarkable. There's no other way to say it. This is one of the most impressive pieces of research I've ever come across because not only was it dead accurate on almost every assumption he made, he basically had a crystal ball, looked into the future, saw what Amazon would become, saw how investors were misinterpreting it now, made accurate predictions of how it would unfold, and then almost with pinpoint accuracy predicted the annualized returns over the next 10 years. And they were hugely excessive returns. So he wasn't just predicting it would be market matching 12%, 10% returns. He predicted 30% annualized returns and Amazon returned 32% over a 10 year period of underwriting. That is remarkable. And I think he deserves credit for that, especially having no research team, no analysts, uh, no office even. Uh, he still works today the same way that he did before. 
just by himself, his own research. Having said that, that's great for the past. He did good research on Amazon and it turned out really well. He got excess returns on it. He's returning 17% plus annualized, which is great. But I want to know, what does he think today? What companies does he see enormous value in today that hasn't been appreciated by the market? Luckily, we can look at that because his portfolio is so massive that it has to be disclosed to the public. His portfolio has an estimated $305 million, um, give or take market volatility, and currently only nine holdings. So a very concentrated portfolio. And it was updated in Q3 of 2021. So this may have changed. He may have sold out of positions, but he is a long-term shareholder. So it's unlikely that it would radically change. Now let's go through it you might recognize some of these names. I recognize many of them. In fact, in my story fund portfolio, there seems to be quite a bit of overlap. Let's go through the top one here, Salesforce. This is a company that I've outlined on video after video ad nauseum about how much I like this company. I consider it, I call it mini Microsoft. This company is like a little Microsoft, but it's focused on an operating system for businesses, small businesses, big businesses, every business in between. Salesforce is your operating system for an entire company. They did incredibly good acquisitions with Tableau, with Slack. They're expanding their offering. They have a huge runway of growth. There's so many characteristics I like about this business. It's easy to get implemented, but difficult to get removed. So the companies stick with it year after year. It doesn't have churn like, like any type of company. No churn like Netflix or Disney Plus. Companies stick with Salesforce once they have it. He has this company as 22% of his portfolio. 22%. Having Salesforce as 22% of your portfolio is a significant bet. Think about that. He has $306 million. He could do the safe thing. Diversify, you know, buy the index in, in kind of a different way, you know, just, just level your companies out so it follows the index. He's not doing that. Having 22% of your money in any company is a significant bet. So for whatever reason, it may not match up with mine. He's very bullish on Salesforce. I think that's interesting to see. Obviously, I see many qualities in the company. I do think it's currently undervalued, especially with its current sell-off it's going through. It traded down quite a bit, uh, 28%. I don't think it was overvalued when it was 28% higher. So I think the company is definitely undervalued right now. But Salesforce is his biggest current bet. The other company after that is Brookfield Asset Management Company. This is an asset management company. I don't know much about it. I haven't done any research on it. Obviously, he knows something about this company. I have looked up the performance of it, and this one has performed very well over the past four years. So this one has been a big winner. This is 15% of his portfolio. So what, whatever reason, he loves Brookfield Asset Management. Maybe one to look at if you're interested in finding out why he liked this company. Number three, with 10.58%, is Spotify. This is a company that's very difficult to hold right now. It recently sold off like crazy as these type of unprofitable, higher risk growth companies got derated. Not only that, but you have the question of margins and profitability. Very similar to Amazon back 10 years ago. Margins and profitability, how are they, how are they ever going to be profitable? They don't generate a lot of free cash flow. They don't generate a lot of EBIT margins, right? Spotify is in the same situation. People don't think this company's ever really going to be profitable. Uh, it's just a long-term growth story. And the scale question and profitability is still in the air. Well, obviously, he thinks a brighter future awaits Spotify because almost 11% of his portfolio is in the company. The company also has a lot of issues going on right now. They have the big controversy with Joe Rogan. Who knows how that's really going to turn out? Uh, a lot of things going on with Spotify. But this is another company with number three, 10%, that I'm very bullish on. I've made numerous videos on this company, and it's one that I am still today very bullish on. Then in number four at 10.47%, he has Trupanion. I don't know about this one at all. I looked it up a little bit. Someone else that knows more will have to dive into this company because I've done no work on it so far. But this is one that he's very bullish on. The performance of it has been pretty mediocre. So not a huge winner as of the past five years. After that, 10% of his portfolio is still in Amazon. So even after a decade of owning it and having these excess returns, he still thinks it deserves 10% allocation. Uh, not surprising, in my opinion. I think Amazon probably still undervalued, still a long-term growth story. They're in infrastructure. Uh, there's going to be a lot of winners. I think Costco will be in Walmart and Amazon will still be a huge winner. Then we have, what is this? Number, number five, number six, we have Netflix. 
This is one that's surprising to me as well. When I thought about it though, and I think through his mind frame and the way that he looks at it, I don't think it's quite as surprising as one might think. Everyone thought 10 years ago that Amazon would never become profitable. It would never have high margins. That's the big question Amazon faced. And Josh Tarasov here said, you know, these are the earnings calls where analysts would call in and complain about how Amazon isn't that profitable. It's not that efficient of a company. You can see the exact same debate happening right now with Netflix. Every single discussion about Netflix, every single video made on it, every single YouTuber and thing covering the company is always concerned with free cash flow, free cash flow, free cash flow. They spend so much money on content. How can they ever generate free cash flow? That's the same debate that was happening 10 years ago with Amazon. I think what he does is he buys companies that he knows the eventual growth of the company, the market position, the dominance, the scale effects will eventually lead to higher margins with the company. He did that with Amazon, and I'm assuming he believes the same thing with Netflix, because that's one that he was buying at a much higher price than it trades today. He's buying this one at $150, $200 higher than it trades today. So if he was bullish back then, I assume he's a lot more bullish now, unless he radically, radically changed his investment thesis. But Netflix is another one. This is a company that, again, I'm very bullish on. It's my top position right now, but this is a pretty decent size holding of his. Every holding's big because he only has nine holdings. Twitter. Twitter's at 8.47%. This one, I totally get the thesis. Twitter has 400 million monthly active users. That's a lot of users. They monetize their users at a much less effective rate than Facebook. And if they monetize at the same rate of, of Facebook, it'd be a highly profitable company. So Twitter has a growing user base. All they have to do is figure out how to monetize their users effectively, and this could be a very good story. So Twitter's one I'm actually bullish on, but I don't currently have in my portfolio. Google, he has around 8% of his portfolio. Another company, obviously, I'm hugely bullish on. I think this one is an easy buy. I think your chances of losing money over the next 10 years are incredibly low. Chances of making a lot of money incredibly high. Risk reward is very good. Uh, he has this one as 8% of his portfolio, so he obviously does as well see some good stuff in this one. And then the last one that he's been reducing his position in, so this has been a position reduction, is HubSpot, and it's 6.46%. Now, I know next to nothing about this company. Apparently, it's an inbound software marketing tool company. It was on an absolute tear since 2020. It went up 347%. This is probably why he reduced his position back in early 2021, right? Somewhere around here. He was reducing it because he was up over 200%. So you got to take some gains when that happens this quickly. Uh, it got retraced a bit, down 43%. Luckily, he reduced his position about half before that. Uh, but that's the last one. Overall, a lot of these companies are in my portfolio. I have big overlap with Salesforce, Spotify, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. So it's interesting seeing those. I will be looking at the other companies and figure out what he's, what he's seeing in these companies because maybe there's value there. But I thought this would be an interesting video to highlight. There's other investors outside of just uh, Charlie Munker and Warren Buffett that are remarkable. I think this is one of them. He's only since 2006 into his career, but pretty incredible performance so far. If you like discussing this type of stuff, talking about investing with a lot of other like-minded investors, you can check out the Patreon. You get access to a Discord community. We talk about this stuff and discuss it every single day, as well as other topics, but most of the time investing. So if you want to check that out, there's a link in the description. You also get access to Qualtrum Insights, which is software I'm actively developing. We have two developers working on it. Lots of fun things planned for this. It gives you an incredibly concise very good overview of a company's fundamentals. So the valuation, the margins, the growth, and this helps give you a foundation when you're looking at different companies. So you're not just blindly investing. But that's all for this episode. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one.